Welcome back to the Entrepreneur. My name is Joshua Yankovic, and joining me today is the glorious, no, glorious. <laughs> hey, I'm, I killed, I'll take glorious, totally. The glorious runway model, Ariel Suzanne. Welcome back. It's fantastic to have you again. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, when you walked in, I was like, she's just radiating again. Wow. Actually, not even again, because you, you've clearly like, grown a lot since we've last seen each other um and it's been about it's been about a year mm -hmm. and i know you've got a lot to express for how much you've learned i'm excited to learn from you like see where you've been and what you've seen i'm happy to share i'm looking forward to it there's been quite a bit okay then let's start from the beginning if you want um do you want to tell me a little bit about where you started because you we're talking when we first met, um, you were selling your stuff, you were giving it away and you were jumping out in faith, basically faith in yourself for this journey that you were going on as a d digital nomad is what, how you described it to me at the time. Yeah. So, um, when we had last talked, as you had mentioned, I had just sold or gave away about 75% of my stuff and I put about 20% in storage and I took the remaining amount and put it in my CRV and I, had a very loose plan of what it is that I was going to do. I just kind of had this um, vision, this idea kind of in the back of my head that had been there for about 11 years, but you know, a lot's changed in 11 years. Yeah, so, so you had been contemplating taking that step, that step out into the freelance world. And, and, and I also forgot to mention, you do a lot of freelance writing as well. Mm -hmm. On top of all your other entrepreneurial adventures, you, you do freelance writing. Yes. So I, you know, but, you know, it's really only been within the last like 10 years that there's actually been more and more infrastructure that's been put in place for what a digital nomad is. And, and really, if you think of what a digital nomad is, it's kind of broken down into two parts. So the digital part is um, you have the ability to work remotely. So whether you building your own business or you already have a business that you work for or whatever but you have that ability and the nomad part is you know you either travel full or part-time so um, now it's actually really exciting because you actually are starting to have nations is kind of what I'm hearing too like Costa Rica for example like I need to research this to make sure this is true but um, actual nations are starting to recognize the legitimacy and the importance of digital nomad life. So anyways, about a year ago, that's what I did. I kind of made this decision. I had to make a decision because, you know, my landlord at the time was kind of knocking on my door, you know, figuratively speaking and saying, are you going to stay here another year? So that idea of like travel and um, figuring life out on the road and building a business from there and really pursuing the, my long list of passions um, in that sort of a life reality suddenly felt like it was something that made sense that I could actually go, okay, it's time. So I had quit my job at the beginning of the year, my corporate job. Um, and then September 1st last year, I got my CRV with my stuff and literally drove out into the sunset towards Colorado. And I cannot believe it's already been a year. Yeah, it's gone by. It's gone by so fast, but so much has happened. So, so much. much has happened. Mm -hmm. I know for me, so I can only imagine you as well traveling, like the experiences you must have had. Tell me, tell me something um, about what you've learned so far. Okay. So or maybe I, start with, yeah, wherever you want. I want to just, so I want to hear much. about it. Let's <laughs> okay. unpack it all. Okay. So I would say like, you know, I think the digital nomad life or perhaps travel in general kind of has this like very glamorous sort of a reputation. That's not to say it's not glamorous because it is like, it's wonderful to be able to decide when I'm going to work and how I'm going to work and who I'm going to collaborate with and where I'm going to go next and, you know, how long I'm going to live there and what part of that city I'm going to live in. Like, it's great to be able to feel like I'm empowered to make those decisions as well as, you know, I get to see the world the way that I want to see it. And I'm not just stuck in one particular place. And that's important to me. So, but, you know, going out on the road 
you know, in the middle of a year like 2020, you know, I, I was very aware of the fact that I didn't have a plan. Like I am by no means saying that people need to have a plan. I mean, I know some people are, would probably gawk at that and be like, oh, you always have to have a plan. I mean, okay. If that makes you feel good, that's, I, I get that. You know, I am, I'm also very aware of the fact that I'm the kind of person that I think I'm much more okay with taking risks than some people, and that's okay. I think it's necessary. Yes. It's necessary to be okay with taking risks because... Mm hmm. Yeah, I see it. I basically see it as fear is going to be present in almost every single decision that we make, even the ones that we know, like I knew that I knew that I knew that I was making the right decision. But that doesn't mean that fear wasn't, you know, present. And I think that there's kind of this like, maybe this misnomer or whatever around that idea. And to me, I just really got to the point where I was like, listen, Fear is going to be there. So you have a decision of how you're going to rendezvous with it. And it literally is your decision. So is either I could confront that fear, face that fear and go, you will not take me out. I will like, I will pursue this because this feels right. Or I could succumb to fear and decide that, you know what, I'm going to go against what I know to be right and I'm going to sign another year lease. And every time I think about, like, because trust me, there's been plenty of moments over the past year where I've been like, what the hell have I done? You know, oh my God, like, am I, am I going to absolutely, like, lose it here? Or am I going to be homeless? Am I going to be, am I going to lose my tribe? Like, all of these things, right? But I think that's part of what a decision like this, why it was so important, is that it literally put me to the point where there was two options. I could either sink or I could swim. Hmm. But I really was like, it really was like jumping off a cliff and being like, all right, I'm just going to trust. Even though I don't have a plan, I'm going to trust. I know I'm going See, the right direction. Even imagining that state of being feels good to me because I'm in a similar situation. Like I have a bit of security with a nine to five, but everything else right now is requiring me to fall into that level of acceptance of fear and discomfort and, and not to nego negotiate whether or not I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Like I, a big thing for me this year is not, I was staying in, or I was realizing that I'm not going to negotiate with myself anymore. Or not realizing, but de deciding for myself that I'm not going to negotiate with myself anymore on doing the things that I know need to be done for me. Like self-care, like that whole concept. Um, and I know we could unpack self-care, but I want to hear more about what's ha been happening with you and like how, how your journey has gone. So, um, Let's go back. Uh, let me let me think. So you were at that moment in time or that step where you are in that free fall in that moment of discomfort. So, OK, so t take me back. I'm really glad that you just you pulled me back to the original question, because I do have a tendency to be like, but there's this and this to talk about. So, um, yeah, so I, I, made I have decision. hardcore ADHD oh, as well. I, I feel the same way. Well, I don't know if you do or not, but I, I, I do. And I have trained myself to reel it back <laughs> it, yeah. it takes a great deal of, of effort sometimes because I really do yeah from thing to thing to thing subject to subject to subject there's nothing that's uncomfortable to bring up and talk about and then it's like oh I could talk about that yeah yeah right and back and forth but I really want to like um mm -hmm. delve into the value in your experience that you've had since we last saw each other so tell me more about that leap of faith that you've taken so um 
practically speaking, what it looked like is that I spent two, two and a half weeks out in the Colorado area, which is pretty great. And then I went back to the Chicago area, which is a, a place of home for me. That's where I, that's where my roots are. That's where I grew up. That's where I have a, a large amount of family that's there. And I was only going to go back because there was a particular tryout for a fashion show that was there. And I was just going to be there for three weeks. And then as time went on, it basically was like, I don't think, I don't think that I'm really ready to move on to the next place as well as, you know, I was having to navigate a bunch of different factors um, that came up in 2020, such as COVID. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that, because I had to be very economical with my uh, places where I lived, you know, one of the ways that I had decided that I was going to, uh, you know, not just rent a bunch of Airbnbs, I was going to do house sitting and pet sitting, which is an actual, like, there are apps out there for that. And there are people that look for good house sitters and good pet sitters. And I love pets and I love taking care of people's spaces. So um, I say that to say is that what became difficult was that because of COVID, there really wasn't anything available on the different spaces. So I was kind of caught in this very strange place. I think internally for about six to seven months, I stayed in the Chicago area with my mom, um, which ended up, you know, looking back, like it ended up being actually a very important time, not only for myself, but also for my mom as well. Um, there were some significant things that happened during my time there that were not only significant for me, but also for herself and getting her set up in the new phase of her life as well too. So, but in the meantime of all this, you know, I'm really struggling with, you're a failure. Everybody's watching you. You said you were going to do all this traveling. You're not doing anything. You're staying here for six to seven months. You haven't moved. You're just at that time, like I still was trying to find my voice and find like, how was I going to redirect my blog and how was I going to build this business and what kind of business exactly am I looking to build right now? So I had all these questions and I was really in a, a huge state of self-discovery. And it was really during that time that the beginning, I mean, self-care is always important to me, but it was really during that time that I was quite in a, in a um, incubation period. Started doing a lot of meditation. It started to be something that I started in um, incorporating my life, you know, every single day, really focusing on the wrong beliefs and the wrong narratives that I have convinced myself um, mm. will be how my life turns out, you know, narratives that were told to me and the narratives that I actually told myself. Right. So, the ones that you chose to pick, keep and believe. Yeah. I want to just point out like how interesting it is that these realizations came for you when you were in a moment of almost, would you call it desperation almost? Yeah, it was rough. That like was you were in so uncomfortable, but you were having to sit with yourself on it. And that's when you faced yourself in a way that you hadn't before. And you realized these things. Is that true to say? Yeah, I think so on some level, like it, you know, or maybe something that you knew you knew for a while, but you hadn't decided to address. I think that, it was more of that I had space. Yeah. I had removed every other physical thing in mm -hmm. my life by that point. You know, I think one of the um, interesting things I think about modern life is that we get so busy. And I know we say it, but I don't think we necessarily, some of us don't realize until we're actually pulled out of it that we go, wow, this is what we're missing. This is the part of myself I didn't know was here. This is a part of myself that I knew possibly that needed to be changed and needed to be adjusted and dealt with, but I didn't have, number one, the time. And then if I did have the time, I didn't have the emotional or mental capacity to. So this was the first opportunity I think I had where it was like everything else, all the other physical parts of my life that would have been obstacles before were, were removed. Wow. So I want to... I, I mean to interrupt, but I want to point out also what you just said is that's really, it's really interesting that you related the understanding having time with emotional and emotional space and availability. So like people talk about being busy 
and they're like, oh, I'm busy. And, and if you really pick apart or talk, think, look at what they're doing, they're not always that busy, but it's directly related to their level of emotional maturity or availability or understanding. It's like, it's inversely, or not, yeah, it's directly related, not inversely related. It's directly related to how busy they think they are. Mm-hmm. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I think this whole, like, I'm loving the fact that this, that people are starting to cancel the hustle culture. And I really am loving that direction because I remember even when I was like 2019 and I was like, you know, really starting all kinds of new things. And I was like, I'm a hustler, babe, and hashtag hustler, babe, and all that stuff, right? But really, like, there was something about it that just didn't feel authentic and didn't feel right. It felt like there was something about that that was missing. And I think what I, I feel like that I am really discovering and I'm really grateful that I think that there's kind of on a corporate level over, especially over the past year, maybe more, I don't know, but maybe it could just be because I'm more aware of it now, but where people are starting to, you know, really go, I, I need to take care of myself. I, I, I really think it's because they, we, everyone went home, everyone went home and worked remotely Mm -hmm. and that it opened a lot of people's eyes to what work can be like and what it should be like and proved for like, a huge chunk of the working industry that their jobs could be done from home. Um, that I think that opened a lot of people's eyes to the whole like hustler Mm -hmm. culture and that kind of mindset, which I I do think that's interesting that you saw that as well from your perspective. Yeah. I feel like 2020 was the year of the great reset. There was like Like some Renaissance type stuff happening for real as much as people like think negatively about everything that's happened. And it is, it's like some very, very bad things that happened. I've lost um, a friend this year to COVID and, and they were, I mean, it's awful. And there's some, it's, it's really awful. Mm -hmm. But from the ashes, you know, Mm -hmm. Phoenix rises. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it's just really like, gosh, there's so many things to unpack there. So I'm trying really hard to uh, dial in. So what's really, what I think is really important is in the aftermath of this year of the Great Reset, it's true, exactly what you're saying. It's that I feel like for some people, maybe more, I'm not really sure, but I know definitely for myself that there was just kind of this knowing, internal knowing that like, think we're kind of missing it here like I mean you know it's it's really interesting because there's like a long list of things that I think in society we're told like take those risks you know you know you need to work on yourself all of those things but really we set up the culture to be like you have to everything has to be planned and everything needs to be a particular way and you know no you don't need to work on yourself you just need to work harder you just need to grind harder and you know, I think what was really interesting about 2020 is it really removed that in a lot of ways that cap and showed, I think, what some people had been seeing for a long time, which is like, this is bullshit. Like, this doesn't make like, what is the point of doing all of this work if I get to the very end of it and I completely lose myself? My health is gone. My relationships are crap. I have nothing to show for my personality. My character is awful. You know, like I haven't dealt with my stuff that happened when I was 10 years old. Like what is the point of creating successful, full-bodied people if we don't deal with ourselves? Ourselves. Like, and I think what was really interesting about, yeah, with 2020 and then, you know, by the time I left and I became a digital nomad and it's fall and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, I'm like, I feel like I'm a failure, but I'm, I am measuring it against that long list of criteria in the hustle culture or just culture, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Right. In uh, general. Yeah. That says that I'm not doing enough when really it's like, actually I'm doing a lot of stuff right now. I'm, I am grinding out dealing with old beliefs i am and you're happy yeah with it yeah yep i am 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I, it's a side effect of mm-hmm. doing what, more of what you love to and what you like to do. The universe, the all, the Tao, God rewards it with more of what you mm-hmm. are okay with and good with. Like we aren't ever given more than we can handle. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really interesting. Like, I, I think part of it, like, it's also that whole idea of an understanding how lack plays in our lives and how abundance is supposed to be, how we show up in our life and how that simple concept right there grinds against every other part of our life if we don't deal with it. Mm-hmm. Like the, even, yep. you know, it's like if we don't, there's like this fear. If I if I don't actually keep grinding it out, if I don't give 110%, like somebody else is going to take what is quote unquote rightfully mine, you know, when it really it's like, but if we actually, if we start to step into this, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to do my meditation. I'm going to change old narratives and old belief, whatever that self-care looks like. But as long as it's actually dealing with, not just talking about it, but actually on a emotional and mental level, physical level, dealing with the old beliefs that we have that we're a failure, we're not wanted, we will never amount to anything, whatever those lost of things are, we will always continue to believe that there's never going to be enough for us, that we will never actually be able to have the things that we've always known are supposed to be ours. So I just, that was honestly, to answer your question in a long-winded sort of a way, that was actually the the main thing that I did for, honestly, up until probably February or March, is I was really, and I still am, like it's not an, it's a continuous journey, but I really was constantly dealing with and you know really going hard at facing yourself yes that's how i felt in the past um several months as well is like i removed all substances from my body and i stopped smoking weed and in february i i you know went completely i stopped drinking and then several months later completely stopped doing everything and that's made a huge huge difference for me to allow me to really face myself and see what there is to see within me and I like that you talked about it, like on a physical level and a physio or a physiological level and a mental and a psychological level because it's all tied in together and looking at being able to pick apart stuff because it's not necessary to do it all the time I don't think because you get to the point where you're at ease but I have been very much so in the same boat as like going very hard at facing myself so Ariel tell me a little bit more after you kind of like went through that that hard spot where you were kind of in a limbo almost in all of this while I'm allowing this process to happen I you know I was really trying to figure out what is my voice and it was really around that time by voice what do you mean for someone who is listening that doesn't know or doesn't really can you re- reword it to a couple in a couple ways that so multiple people could uh, grasp that concept yes so as a writer as an entrepreneur as someone who has a blog but also who is someone who has more of a visionary sort of a mindset and has a lot of different ideas and has a lot of different projects that she wants to do I it's it's had been difficult for me and I still find it difficult at times to really kind of like find specific verbiage that I can you know kind of whittle down and say these this is who I am and this yeah. is the resource that I am to the your world. truth correct would you say that yes my and truth. being able to put it out there in a way that is accurate to who you are right and in the world where you know really what's really important too is that we are all in a way building a brand, right? You know, it's we are all our own personal brand, right? So it's 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 finding the, it's fine tuning that verbiage to where someone who maybe doesn't know me could communicate to someone else who doesn't know me and says and say, Ariel Suzanne is this. This is who she is. 
but I was really struggling with, I don't know how to whittle that down. So it was really in that process, I was beginning to, to find that verbiage, find that quote unquote voice to be able to know, okay, this is the direction I'm going to move forward with my blog, recreating my website, and even just the way that I post and put out material in addition to the, the creating a business that I can market well to people. Hmm. So that's really what was happening at that time. So putting out value and something that adds to people's lives, um, how do you, that's how I think about it. And it's part of my current struggle too for me is like putting out content b- because I think about it of is this going to be accurate to who I am and are people are going to interpret it correctly. And I've had to like, and I'm slowly letting go of needing to make sure that people take it the right way. Like I'm beginning to, you know, reframe that to who gives a, who cares? No one cares about, I don't care about it, how other people are going to interpret it because I can't control that. And I've had to like realize, and I, I say this all the time, I say the serenity prayer is like, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things that I can. But the courage, or I mean the serenity to accept the things I cannot change is a huge, huge first part of that is why it comes first is because there's a whole lot more that I can't control than I can control. And other people's opinions and thoughts is definitely one of the things I can't control. And so I am currently in that zone of like beginning to put more out and on the verge of putting a whole lot of things out because I'm not caring about what my family thinks anymore. I'm not caring what my old friends and what people knew about who knew me 10 years ago when I was a piece of and people who knew me even two years ago or even eight months ago when I was not the same person. I was not, I was a child almost. Like I've grown so, that much in such a short time. And that's not necessarily like uncommon. I just had a whole lot of realizations all at once um, for things that I should have known, learned and known at a younger age probably. But I spent six over six years drinking and partying and doing dumb things with my life and thinking I was having fun and doing good. But really, I was just forcing myself to suffer through a lot of BS that I could have learned more from sooner, but I wouldn't take any of it back. I wouldn't take any of it back. Like there's nothing that I would take back that I've gone through despite how awful some of it was. And that's let me be able to see like who I am now and what I have now and appreciate what I have now because I wouldn't know the difference if I hadn't, you know, I wouldn't know the difference between the highs and lows as much as I do now, if I hadn't had some lows in there. And I do believe that almost 100% of those lows were self-sabotaged or self-created. Like I put that on, I put myself in situations that led to situations that led to situations on, I was on a path and I know that there was moment, I'm sure there was, I know there, I remember moments in where my dad was telling me like that I was on a path of destruction or a path of something or other, something bad, negative. And at the time I was like, no, 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 no. I'm doing whatever I want to do because I don't care about myself. I don't care about other people. And so I do whatever I want. And that's what I did. I mean, I don't know. I took things, a lot of things to the extreme. And drinking was a competitive sport almost. So it was like a bad time for me and um, a bad time for everybody else around me. And just like forced me to suffer through things when I like wanted so much more and and deeper connections and better situations in life, but I was putting myself in the opposite situations with the opposite results, wondering why I wasn't having a better life or having better times. And none of it made sense to me until more recently. And that's why this year has been so big for me. And there's been so much happening in a short amount of time because like, 10 years of mistakes kind of all started to connect for me in a way that I understood the reasons behind those actions and those events that took place in the, in that period of time. And it's just interesting, like that it's happened in such a short time for me. Um, but saying like putting out my voice, um, it's a big, 
a big moment for me right now is like I'm on the verge of saying a whole lot more to a whole lot of people and it's pretty scary but it has to be done like that's my personal brand like I have more I have so much more to tell everyone I'm so much more to say and I'm just I'm part of me is super excited to t- talk about it and at the same time there's always still those underlying those, those thoughts that pop up there's like oh what my cousins think that I just did it and just what my family like over here and what about these people that knew me years ago screw you because <laughs> this is a new life and I talked about this um before not in a podcast but quantum jumping and jumping timelines or creating a timeline that I'm a part of that I want to be a part of is a very real thing and I'm going to start talking about some real woo woo stuff and some things that are just for the most part, um, not really like mainstream, but there's a huge crowd of people out here that is the people that I'm speaking to. And they're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And they're going to know exactly who I am when I start to say my truth and tell people who I am. Um, and everyone else doesn't matter. But yeah, so back to Miss Ariel Suzanne. I got off on a tangent. It's good. With speaking your truth. And you began to do that. What were the results? So I, like I said, am about to kind Mm -hmm. of on the verge of that kind of process. What was the results for you? Like, how did you feel and what, what were the results? So first, I just want to say, I think it's really important. And I I love the fact that you're at that point. You're in, you're a lot of, I just, it's, I always find it's, it's sad that, you know, I'm, I'm, okay, what I'm trying to say, I'm excited that there are more and more people that are saying, you know what, what's first things first, what should be the foundation first before I move forward into success or whatever needs to be I need to I need to care for myself and I need to deal with those different things and it truly is amazing when like I like people say it right like I see I see posts about it I hear podcasts on it I see articles about it where people say first things first you have to deal with yourself you see self-help books on it from people that are super successful that are saying you know the the best thing that you need to do is you need to deal with these beliefs. You need to discover yourself, all of these things, right? But there still is this aversion to that. But it really is amazing that when you're in it and you see the results that come of it, like you were talking or we were talking earlier in this podcast about like, you know, uh, just that, like, Oh, what am I trying to say here? What I'm, what I'm, what I guess what I'm trying to say is that the, um, it's, it's been pretty amazing as I'm building my business, as I am dealing, as I am dealing with my stuff, as I'm showing up in life, as I'm being authentic, as I'm beginning to stretch my arms or wings or whatever you want to call it in that area, that, that whole concept of work smarter, not harder is so much easier. I have collaborations that come finding me. I have, and they're legitimate collaborations. I have, instead of working myself to the bone, like there's been a couple moments that I've like almost stepped over the precipice of like, I guess I just got to get in there and grind it out and I'm going to just pump all this stuff out and I'm going to exhaust myself and burn myself out on this old way of doing life and old way of doing business. And then something happens where somebody comes knocking at my door and says, hey, I have a really cool project for you. Or, hey, I think that you would be right for this particular direction that we have. Like, it's it's just amazing when we do that. So um, I think the reason so that's one of the results that I've had is that as I have been finding my you've been rewarded, I've been rewarded, you've been rewarded for taking those for speaking your truth. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes I think what's important, even with that phrase of speaking your truth, sometimes that means that you don't necessarily have to say it out loud to everyone. It's okay, also true. Speaking so your let's truth to let's, yourself let's too, rewind right? to 
yeah, your voice, finding your voice. Let's say it like that way, rather than speaking your truth. Because you're right, it's not necessary to um, use that rhetoric, I guess. It's more of your voice, finding your voice. Well, I think you could actually use it. I just think that, I just feel like the the term can be a little bit broader there, but. True, okay. Um, yeah, we can be more, specific is better. So yeah, that yeah. there's less room for interpretation. Yes. So, uh, yes, so finding your voice, speaking your truth, whatever, how, that process always starts internally, personally, with yourself, in your room, in your car, in your wherever. And that it really is your amazing. Your inner voice and, and your listening inner voice. to it. Yeah, and, then, yeah, and listening to it. Uh-huh. That's huge, 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 is listening to your inner voice. Yeah. Because it's one thing to be like, uh, I know I shouldn't go into this building because there's gonna, the X, Y, Z is going to happen. For example, like for me, it would be like, do I want to go into this party? I, first of all, I would never set myself up in a situation like this again. or, or I would avoid these kinds of situations. But for example, it's just like things where it's like, your inner voice speaks to you and it, you know it's something's not right. You know something's and it's listening to it and saying, okay, instead of saying, I don't care what you're, what that, that feeling of not wanting to do this. Cause I remember, and now in this moment, I'm thinking about all these times where my inner voice, my inner dialogue was don't do that. Don't take another drink. Don't go to another bar. Don't, do X, Y, Z in that kind of scenarios. And I just was like, I don't care. I'll do it anyway. Watch me. I'll do it anyway. So I love that listening to that voice. Yeah. And you know, honestly, like, in, again, that's another one of those phrases that we say that is said often in this culture, but yet when you actually put it into practice, it's amazing the kind of backlash you get, you know, that whole thing of where you say, listen to your intuition. Mm-hmm. And when you do something like I'm going to listen to my intuition and I'm going to sell my stuff and I'm become a digital nomad in the middle of COVID. Right. And then you have people that will say, well, maybe you shouldn't have done that. And it's like, but I did what. Did you have any family members tell you not, that you like that doubted? No, Good. I didn't. That's I actually cool. have a very supportive family. That's really cool. Yeah. But, you know, there's just that, there's that, that somehow that is somehow, even if you have the intuition, there's all these like checks and balances that I think society puts on it that, well, you can have the intuition, but you need to control it in these particular ways. You need to be able to have these particular things lined up. So I just think it's, I I, I love the fact that more and more of those sort of things are are um, being challenged and people are going, you know, I am. I'm going to listen to my intuition. I'm going to trust it. It's right. It really is right if I just believe it. Hmm. That's so powerful. It's so, so powerful. Trusting it. Trusting yourself. I mean, I we say it and your voice and intuition, but it's yourself. Mm-hmm. It's who you are behind your thoughts, behind your feelings. And I've talked um, a little bit about this before, never in a podcast, but I'm super excited to talk about it right now. Is that camera rolling still? Sorry to make you get up. A huge part of my growth this year has been separating my thoughts and my feelings from who I am because they are not me. Like I feel my feelings and I have thoughts, but they are not who I am and they are not me. They're not even from my source from source from myself that's behind myself (laughs) um little inception there but there's such a power in the understanding that you are not who your thoughts are you're not who your feelings are and choosing how to react to either one thoughts or feelings is the power that you gain from it because we have around 60,000 thoughts a day like that's the average number given number that we uh, of thoughts per day that people have and any one of those can be given power over your given moment because we're in this moment it's all we have and if I have a thought that comes up and I give it time and I give it power and the ability to exist for long enough it's going to affect me and I'm sure like 
I know you, you mentioned meditation. Like I'm sure that has helped you with your thoughts. Cause I know that a part of meditation is having thoughts, but like having not no attachment to it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a, a part of meditation, at least Eastern or Buddhist meditation. I know it is, um, with not being able to, or not having to hold on to anything, hold on to any thoughts or feelings. And so just back to that, like a huge part of my growth this year has been not letting myself hold on to anything too long. And I, I still regress. I've regressed multiple times this year into, into letting myself be affected by things I shouldn't have, but it's awareness of those things and awareness of those moments that is really important. Um, I just wanted to say all that out loud because I haven't, good. I haven't said it on, on video yet. And, uh, so I was excited. Okay. So we're back to you in Chicago. So you got into some runway stuff, um, some modeling. I know that you kind of intended, did you intend to do that going out? Um, or was that kind of just spontaneous? So I started bottling about two and a half years ago. Um, but you know, since COVID happened, there was kind of like this lost year of modeling. Um, but what I did do while I was on the road is that because I am I'm pretty well connected with um, some fashion communities, I reached out to them. I said, hey, do you guys know any local um, photographers in, in the Chicago area that you trust? And I did have some um, fellow models that pinged back and said, this one's really great. This one's really great. This one's really great. So I reached out to um, those particular, uh, photographers. And then I did have certain Chicago photographers that reached out to me. So I didn't do any runway because no one was doing runway for the right. entire year. Um, but you know, I did, I, I ended up getting a gig back. I forgot we're still in the middle of 2020. Yeah. So it was a lockdown kind of stuff yeah. in, a, in some ways. And so you some so you did do modeling, but not the runway Correct. quite yet. I was um, doing prints or st photos, stills, models, portraits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Building my portfolio. Excellent. Okay. So how has that, like, did you learn some valuable things in that from that? Yeah, like, so one of the things that's actually really important to me is that I, I have some bigger goals, and one of them is is that I love networking. And so I really hope that in some level, I'm still figuring out what this looks like, but as I get to know, diff as I get to um, experience and live in different cities throughout the United States, as well as internationally, I want to create um, kind of bridges between those cities by developing relationships with people in those different cities. So, you know, really I just saw it as an opportunity for me to kind of kind of tip my tip my toe in, dip my toe in. Dip your toe in. Dip my toe in and go, okay, like is this the kind of community that I'm gonna be building here? You know, I'm a big proponent of no matter what. Like, okay. So in in addition to finding your voice, you are also finding your audience. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it was a little bit of finding my audience, but it was more of finding finding the direction mm. of the tribe that I'm building. Yeah. So, you know, um, it was really just kind of trying to go like, who exactly are my people while I'm on the road? And who exactly does this sort of life, does this particular story, which is digital nomad, which is you know, freelance writer, which is, you know, being in the fashion industry and in modeling in my 30s, like, who does that talk to? And then figure out, like, through trial and error, as well as, you know, I just, just enjoy meeting people, you know, developing relationships along the way. So I did do some modeling, but it was just, you know, building my portfolio and getting to know different photographers in the Chicago area before I circled back to Kansas City in March last year, this year. Gotcha. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So then what happened? <laughs> I guess I just could have kept talking, huh? So um, so then I ended up heading back to Kansas City because I had a good friend that she was showing a, a fashion line and she had chosen me to walk for her and I was excited to walk for her. So I came back to 
Um, Kansas City Fashion Week, which I know some people may roll their eyes and be like, Kansas City Fashion Week. But I'm telling y'all, like, KC Fashion really is taking off in particular ways. Do not write us off. Like, there is some pretty great designers that are in the area and great visionaries that you will probably be hearing about. So, um, but I, Kansas City Fashion Week, what they had decided to do was they were going to do a virtual fashion show, which is what some fashion shows were deciding to do. So that's what we did. So it was kind of a weird experience because it was like you get there at like 630 in the morning and then you shoot your runway walk to a small group of people and they videotape you twice walking down the runway, which really, you know, in real life runway, you just have one shot, you know, and you go out there and you do your little poses and then you walk back. Right. Um, and we were done by 930 in the morning, which was just kind of a weird experience. But um, so I came back to KC, but I would say probably the most significant. Yeah, but don't downplay like that. You walked in a fashion runway show in a major city in the United States, like it's a big deal. Yeah, no, it is. Absolutely. And I, and I know how uh, you mentioned all the amazing visionaries and designers like mm-hmm. that's super cool. Yeah, very. Yeah. And I mean, it's not so I have I mean, I've I've been modeling for for about two and a half years. So Mm -hmm. that was the first runway show I had done in, I think, a year and a half at that point. Right. So because of all everything mm -hmm. happening with COVID. Yep. Yep. Uh, Because I was scheduled for some other shows, but they had to cancel or reschedule. So um, but I will say probably one of the most significant things that happened during my time of coming back to Kansas City um, in March and April was, so with modeling, right? Like, because I also started later, for me, one of the reasons why I felt comfortable to finally get on a runway and all of those things is that I went to therapy. <laughs> And I dealt with a lot of old fears that I had in this, you know, I think, so I think if, if we had to think, I guess sometimes of, if there's a word, a banner that has been over your life, what would it be? For me, it was, it's been unwanted. That's been something I've really always kind of struggled and something that I'm still really working through. So that word really kept me from, you know, people would ask me to model in my twenties and I was like, no, I'm not going to do that, you know? But it wasn't until I saw some runway models walking about three years ago that I was like, I could do that. And I had I had done therapy for a couple for a couple years at that point, so I just felt confident. But there still is this like I'm a pretty determined person. I will keep doing things even if they're uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So I just kept showing up. And yeah. I kept showing up to these runway shows. I kept showing up to these you know, photo shoots, just absolutely terrified. You know, I was, uh, you know, I have value in, you know, I was like working with model coaches and I was very grateful because I'm a hard worker, like certain, certain committees within the Kansas City area, like recognize that. And they, you know, they trusted me pretty quickly, but I still had to, had to get comfortable with who are you, Ariel? So underneath this whole banner as well of, finding your voice, figure, figuring out like, what am I show, What am I bringing to the table as a person in the world? Part of that is, is like, what exactly is my look as a model? Like that's part of that discovery process. So I say all that to say is that I would get done with these model shoots or I would get done with a runway show and I get, I'd feel maybe pretty good about it. And I get the pictures back and I'd be like, oh man, I didn't, man, I'm so disappointed. Like either I didn't, I didn't, I saw something in the picture that I wouldn't have thought about beforehand, you know, and then it was like hindsight was difficult to have to deal with. And then I was kind of put down this spiral of shame and, you know, self-hatred and all of those different things. For what part? Um, Because you like, oh, I didn't turn my head or, oh, I didn't. I should have done a different move. Is it like stuff like that? Yes. So like, like so small things you were picking yes. apart. Yeah. 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 We do that. People do that. And how did you, how did you get through that? What would you do to address that? 
So, I mean... Or what do you do to address that? Because for me, I still sometimes struggle with those those kinds of um, mentalities where it's like brief moments of mm -hmm. regression of into an old, uh, old version of me where I don't think I'm good enough or I, or I feel unwanted. Mm -hmm. The struggle is still there, I think, at times. But I genuinely have... I've gotten better. Like... Yeah. I've just gotten better. Just like naturally it happens less. Yes. Yeah. So what was cool about when I got came back to Kansas City is that I met up with a really incredible photographer. His name is Tyler. <laughs> um, and I would love to give the Instagram handle at some point, but he's amazing. Um, I met up with him and he was... Just do like this. You can say... Tyler. <laughs> Tyler Carlson. This is his Instagram handle. Check him out. Um, but he's just a really great photographer. Um, and so anyways, we had talked about shooting together for about a year or so. And I actually write about my experience with Tyler. It's called Chapter 2, colon Tyler, in my blog. You should check it out. But the... Um, but what was really great about it, what was really significant about it was that was the first time I had done a model shoot in several months. Um, so there was this natural feeling of like, oh my gosh, have I lost it? As well as the fact, again, I'm in my 30s. So I deal with like, um, you know, am I, am I too old? All of those things. And I got the pictures back and I was just like, damn, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Like I felt confident. Like... Do I still have work to do? Yes, but I'm getting there. Like I'm beginning to, you can tell that I'm beginning to rest into, okay, this is your look. Like this is the particular, these are, this is a couple of the genres that my look speaks to. So that was really important. And honestly, since then, like I had a runway show, um, my first real live runway show in like two years, which was amazing. Um, was actually, I was the, my, it was back on the runway, um, where I was my very first model gig, my very first runway gig. And my first time I represented a designer it was all wrapped up on this particular runway show. It's called local runway. They're amazing. Um, but I, I walked in that show for the first time in two years at the end of August for the same designer I had walked in before when I had first been on that runway, on that runway. And it is night and day difference. Wow, that must have felt really good. It felt amazing. It was night and day difference to see between my very first ever model picture that I got back mm -hmm. versus the one that I have now. I mean, it's just, I just felt so proud of myself. I was like, oh, you're doing it. Because you, really you can see your growth. Yeah. That's what's great about creating content um, of any sort. Like, And uh, I know Gary Vee talks about this, like putting videos out, even if it's just like you with a phone and yourself talking, like, stuff something like that because you look back on it and it's proof of where you've come from and how you've gone and where you've come from and how much you've grown since then mm -hmm. so it's really cool that you ex have experienced that and firsthand with like seeing your own growth mm -hmm. after just a couple of years yeah absolutely and i think that i like i am in a much healthier place because of also what we had talked about earlier is that all that work that I did as well too. Again, I'm still doing the work, but I think it goes back to that. It is more proof of that. It, all of the work that I have been doing is not in vain. You know, I'm able to show up better to the gigs that I have. I'm able to show up believing that I actually have something significant to offer, you know, that I actually, I'm not too old that I do have, you know, people that are wanting to work with me in many different ways. So that's been pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I, uh, one thing, another thing I've adopted this year is I've, I no longer refer to age as a number. I know that there's different ways to talk about that and say that, but because I've, I've met so many people that were way older than me who were not mature. So I've like begun to realize that we're just, it's become fully significant to me in the sense that I know age does not reflect maturity. Experience does. And 
awareness of experience does but like the number of how old the my body is means nothing nothing yeah and i i i agree like i've i've really stopped i mean i'm obviously have to be aware of my age but i really have i i have been training myself to also be like Ariel. Like you're not defined by this number. Like mm-hmm. you're not an expiration date. Like you're a human being that is just moving forward day by day. So just really s- sink into that. And I think that's really important because even going back to things like belief in the way that those things affect us actually physically and mentally and emotionally and all of that on a physiological level and whatever, like, what we think about ourselves, the negativity, the amount of ne- negativity we have for ourselves or the amount of the amount, amount of uh, love and positivity we have for ourselves actually shows on our face. It actually shows within our body. So, you know, that's also part of my self-care too as a model. Like, you know, it's actually really important that I'm very I'm positive. <laughs> and I want to reaffirm it for you because like I said, when you walk through the door to my house, I you right away noticed it. I know. I right away noticed it. That's awesome. Yeah, one of my one of my best friends. I talk to her all the time, and she says the same thing. She's like, "I'm just telling you, you just look different." And um, and she talks to me almost every single day. So that that means a lot. Thank you. Yeah, it makes a di- it makes a big difference and helps me remember where I was at when I talked to you. Like last time I talked to you um, a year ago or so when you were here at the podcast and. So like I said before, so much has happened, and for and it sounds like for both of us, is, is it's really beautiful um, to think that. And I'm so so grateful. It makes me very very grateful to realize how far I've come in just a short amount of time, and how much more comfortable I am with establishing boundaries and like who I am, and and listening to me, like my voice, and being getting more comfortable with expressing that voice and it's just amazing i'm grateful so so grateful for it yeah it matters yeah so you did some awesome runway you had some runway experiences and modeling tell me about um so you were you're what were you doing for to keep with your other time with uh the rest of your time so um That is a huge question. So the, what I mean by that is because I juggle a lot on a daily basis. So for example, um, I'm in Kansas city now. I've been here since the end of August and I'll be here, I think through the end of October. But before this, I spent the entire summer in New York city. So I was hopping around all over New York City. I was in, would be in Brooklyn for a week, and then I would be in Lenox Hill, and then I would be in a different part of Brooklyn. And so I was just volleying back and forth. But again, like how I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, because I'm building a business on the road and I have to be conscious about the economical way that I, you know, live. I do a lot of things like dog sitting and house sitting. So you can find me on the website trustedhousesitters.com. And that's what I used was that website. That's great. And, but what that meant was, was that. That's, that makes sense. I'm sorry. That yeah. makes sense though, because uh, I saw you with different dogs. <laughs> yeah. I was like, there's no way Ariel has all these dogs. <laughs> I've had so many people that have been like, wait, is this your dog? Wait, is that your cat? Like, how do you have so many dogs? Like, don't you travel? Like, I thought you said you don't have an apartment. No, I do not have an apartment. I do not have a set location I go back to. I am just a lover of pets and I'm a really good dog sitter. So hot and pet sitter. So, um, that's what I was doing is I would hop around doing that, but that the amount of, the amount of energy that goes into doing that is quite a bit. Yeah, I can imagine. So and not only just in, in you know, developing relationships with these um, families and doing FaceTimes or possibly going and meeting the pets and doing that travel and whatever, but also when I finally get the gig, then it's also me having to, like I, I traipsed around New York with two bags because I had to pack not only for, 
um, a whole summer abroad, but also I went to the Coco Rocha model camp, which is a four day intensive. Coco Rocha is a um, internationally known model. So very cool. Very, very cool. So while I'm traipsing around New York, though, right, like next to my things like my shorts and my toiletries, I have two pairs of heels. I have six model outfits. The modeling yeah, gear, gear. I have all my model gear. And the and my model stuff was over by, uh, you know, July 3rd. It was just a four-day intensive. So I'm walking around the rest of New York with my... my um, full hiking backpack and then this duffel bag that literally by the end of uh my time in new york city had literally split like the side pocket had actually split and it was the side pocket that has all of my intimates so i like i I had to (laughs) i had to find a way to you know economically because i couldn't get a new duffel bag right like I found a Target cloth bag liner and I put that in there and I put all my, you know, all my intimate stuff in there. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, the it, would have been, it. it would have been, you know, there would have been thongs and bras and all kinds of other goodies like sprinkled over all over the subway <laughs> for the good people of New York City. So like I, you know, I, I was having to, when I would go from location to location, I would have to get into my backpack get into my duffel and then you know because it's new york i'm usually in an apartment building so go down three flights of stairs into a, a, a busy street and then through the lumbering through the Talk subway about concrete jungle yeah you absolutely were, you were <laughs> navigating caravanning it. through the jungle yeah absolutely so i mean but i don't regret it like i i I, it's, I have a strong value for actually experiencing the culture where I'm at. So I was like, yeah, I'll just do it. So, but yeah, I can imagine that was so valuable and so, so fun at the same time. Yes. Cause it was difficult, but it's like pressing into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it also feels really good when you're like, um, what word am I trying to say? When people think that you're a New Yorker, they mistake you for being a New Yorker. Like I was asked probably five or six times directions. And there was actually a couple of those times that I was like, oh, no, you actually like go down this street and this is where you get on the L. And no, it's not that street. It's actually this street. So like I felt like I was an actual New Yorker. But part of the reason why I felt that way was because of the fact that I chose, you know, traveling through trusted house sitter because you know, I wasn't in hotels. I was actually within living. neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. You were living there. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just, a, you weren't tour, touring. Right. You were living. I was actually part of, like, I lived in buildings with, you know, concierge and all kinds of stuff. Like, you just, you become a part of the neighborhood you're in. And that's actually the the New York City I wanted to see. Yeah. I mean, I did go to Times Square. I feel like you have to. And I was around there. So I went. So I went to Times Square. And of course, I went to the Met because I love art. And if you've never been to the Met, literally, I was blown away by how good of the art was. So cool. highly encourage you to go. But Very cool. I've never been to New York. Really? You should go. You should go. If you want I to. I would, oh, I mean, I'm not opposed to it. Visiting. Yeah. For sure. I think it's on the, it's on the list. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I have a long list of, of destinations that are... To be visited. That's good. I always love it when people say they have a long list of destinations. It's really long, and there's very specific ones in really? various countries. Wow. Literally every time I see a post from a place mm-hmm. that I like, that it looks great, I put it down in the list. Good for you. Well, and I hope to, like, part of my process, too, like, Like you had asked, like, what are all the things that you do? Like part of all the things that I do is that I'm paying attention to my own life so that I can actually like write about it and blog about it because I know that there are people out there that not saying that you, I mean, need any sort of advice, but there are people out there that need like, how do you possibly do this on a budget? And how do you like, how do you develop yourself as a digital nomad? And how can as I... As an entrepreneur. Exactly. And as an entrepreneur as That's well That's the too, whole point right? of the entrepreneur. Right. Um, is <laughs> the value that you've experienced is really, really important. And documenting it is really, really important to not only tell your story, but to put a example up 
for someone else who might be on the verge or wanting to do it in a big way, like wanting to do what they love to do or do what they like to do. And I hope that this is like a way that a sign, like if you're listening, like this is a sign, like you can do this. Like I'm bringing people onto this podcast that are either at the moment of taking the the jump, the leap of faith, they've done it, they've taken the leap of faith, and I'm going to continue to bring people onto this show that have insight into getting the life they wanted to get. For me, not getting the life I want is not an option. It's not an option, and I'm and that's non-negotiable. So, I am moving in a way and acting in a way on a small scale that creates my future. And I'm keeping that vision, the big vision in mind. And I know people like Jim Carrey talk about like envisioning that. And it all has to wrap up into like the law of attraction and, and just creating your life. Like it's all, it's all in there. It's all the, everything that they say is, is true. It just takes you to do it. And me to do it for me. And Ariel to do it for herself. Yeah. Which she's doing it. I'm doing it. You can too. Yeah. That accessibility piece I think is really important. That people like see that you don't have to have everything figured out. You never will. No one has it figured out. The, The more I've gotten into doing what I love to do and the more I've like gotten out here into feeling like I'm living life fully. Um, For me, it's by not doing drugs or alcohol whatsoever of any kind. Subtract coffee. I have just come to realize that nobody has it figured out. Nobody knows anything. Just... They know themselves, and the more they know themselves, the more I know myself, the more I know that I don't know. And that actually propels me into being able to do something about it versus staying ignorant of myself and staying ignorant of going out to party and going out to drink and living a life that's meaningless. It's it's straight ignorant. Like, talk about ignorance. Being ignorant of yourself is the worst kind you could possibly be. And I just decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to be like that anymore. I wanted to be better. I wanted to improve not only my life, but I get to a point where I can have influence and an ability to help other people. And this podcast is just a tiny little fraction of what I intend for my future. And I hope that someone... Actually, it doesn't matter. I don't care if anyone thinks this or that about this podcast because I'm going to continue to produce it and because I know that there's value in it. I know that there's value here and in all these all these podcasts that have been produced up to this point. Like we talked about so many valuable things in that first podcast and now looking back at it it's like everything we talked about was definitely true, but now we have even more insight and knowledge about ourselves, which has just increased our lives in that much more. In that much more, mm-hmm. it's been a grind out of that, like from a year ago from that podcast, and you know, really, I was at that point where I was, you know, I was. I knew in my intuition that this was right. I knew in a, I was definitely in the big 30,000 foot view. I could see the big picture. I knew my reasons for doing it. Time is not a renewable, is not a renewable resource. You know, there's no such thing as ready. That incredible quote that's by Hugh Laurie, like all of those different things. Like I knew that. Right. But then after coming out from that and really giving into the grind of, they really weren't kidding. Like this is a process. If you're going to lay a foundation for a future that I want to look back on and be proud of, and that I want to actually feel like I'm the character that I'm going to be, that it, this is important. I have to, like, I, I cannot, I can't skip this step. Like 
I think there is this, there is this, again, this misnomer in society that's, that thinks that, well, we can just go around this gate, right? But there's one gate. Like if you really want to go to a full, to a fulfilling life, you have to go through that, that gate where there's going to be pressure and there's going to be growth and there's going to be character development and there's going to be choices between when you're hit with situations that say, are you going to become better? Are you going to become bitter? Are you going to sink? Are you going to swim? But it's a choice and you have to get through it. So I think it's interesting too, like after just what you're saying, like after that first podcast to now here sitting with you, like we both have gone through such, such important journeys, but it's been, we've been in a process. It's been a grind from that original, but it's been completely necessary to get us to this moment and we're just getting started. I love that. Just getting started. And I know that for a fact because there's still so much I need to figure out and all my life and not all my life, but a lot of my life, people have told me I'm really hard on myself and I really judge myself. Now I'm learning to not judge myself. That's, that's good, but I am not quitting being hard on myself. Because I think it's necessary to grow. I think that people aren't hard enough on themselves. And by everyone telling me that, oh, you're so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Why aren't you harder on yourself? Why aren't you doing more? Like, I feel like I'm not doing anything. And I am and I know I'm doing more than many people. But it's nothing. It's nothing compared to know what, what I know I can do. And how much more I can do. Like, when people say they're busy. When I say I'm busy, like... I take it real seriously. Like I am, I don't say it unless I, unless it's totally true. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just living a life of truth. Like that's part of this 12 step program. I mean, like, I don't like, I tell the truth on everything and it. It's never wrong. It's never wrong to do it. It's almost never like there's no, there's no, there's, I can't think of a situation where it's wrong to do unless someone's life is in danger. That's it. If someone's life's in danger, that's the only time you could, I, I would, could, could see like not like actively projecting the truth to be the best course of action. But that aside, I think I'm hard on myself sometimes. And then a lot of the time though, I don't think I'm hard enough because if I was harder then I would, then the harder I am on myself, the more I, because then I feel bad, right? Well, feeling bad is a, not a bad thing. Because then you know you make like feeling, for example, feeling guilty for not working out when you know you should. Feeling guilty for not eating better when you know you should. Feeling guilty for telling a lie. Feeling guilty for X, Y, Z that you could feel guilty for is your physiological body or fit your psychological mind feeling something that's necessary to tell you you did wrong so i'm going to be hard on myself whenever i feel that way because then i'll be the harder i am the better i'll feel when i do it right the next time or when i improve the process of whatever it is that i didn't do as good the first time and i know that i'm not going to be hard on myself forever i'm going to be less and less hard on myself but at this time in my life i'm pretty freaking hard on myself on purpose because I know that I have a lot of work to do and a lot of growing to do and a lot of character defects that I still have not addressed. Like I'm still learning to maintain my boundaries, which allows me to keep other people from crossing my boundaries and me from crossing other people's boundaries. And that is a process that I'm still learning and it's fairly new to me. And uh, oddly enough, like I spent most of my twenties drinking and partying and I never, considered what boundaries were and what that meant to me because I didn't care about me so much enough that I did whatever I wanted. Um, and I, you know, became a, I mean, in in other ways I became a people pleaser because I would, you know, it was just like just so many wrong things. And I've come into realizations of or awareness this year of those things. And I'm hard on myself because I want to stop doing things that make me unhappy and, and sad or feel bad. I want to do 
things that make me feel good and I'm going to do things that make me feel good and I'm going to continue to do that. And God, the Tao, the all source will reward me for it consistently. Like it never doesn't. When I do something that I know is the right thing to do, I am rewarded for it. Even if it's, even if it's like temporarily feeling bad about it, in the long run, I'm going to benefit. Because again, I'm not ever given something that I can't handle. But yeah, being hard on myself is a thing I think is necessary at this point in my life. I'm not going to do it forever, but right now I'm being really hard on myself. And I think that like, what, so, but you still have within that, which I think may be important to differentiate is that you still have a strong value for genuinely understanding what self-care is though yeah so you think that's not judging i don't i'm not judging myself no hard Mm -hmm. you're just not giving yourself the option for the out yeah right yeah like you you're just done with making any sort of excuse or negotiation with this not happening and you're saying no we're, yeah. we're moving forward in a different way. This is the new narrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No matter how I feel or think about it. Right. I'm moving to the right, in the right direction. Yeah. Right. And no matter what other people think or feel about it or what I think they think and feel about it, because that was a big problem for me is like trying to be some freaking dumb mind reader. And I say dumb because I thought I was smart enough to figure out, to know what people were thinking. And that made, le- and that made all my relationships like sour in in some ways because as an adult, I mean, and, and definitely started as a child, but it's like thinking that thinking of all the things that someone could be thinking and then coming up with, with scenarios for each one of those and then so forth and on mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. And gosh, that's so much mental anguish and pain. That's unnecessary that I just created for myself. That's just mm-hmm. unnecessary pain to try to think about what other people are thinking about yeah. when it's not under my control. Huge thing for me this year mm-hmm. is getting out of that, getting it out of trying to control things I can't control. You know, that's something I'm still struggling with as well, too. Like I have, I am by nature a contemplator. I'm by nature the kind of person that I have a million things. Right. Right. That I'm thinking about all the time. Considering the options. Right. Scenarios, results, mm-hmm. solutions to the to the scenarios. Do you well, do that? So no, not necessarily. I'm more of a when I'm what I mean by for me a contemplator is is that I'm a pretty deep thinker. Yeah. So and I think of it doesn't it's not so, it's not that it's something that I seek out. It just kind of seeks me out. I've always been that way. So for me, like I have so many things that I want to share because I'm by nature the kind of person that when I have all of these things, I, especially if it's either justice oriented or if it's something that is like, I think would be really helpful for people, but maybe they're not ready for it yet. Like I've held back for the most part. I have not been genuinely true a hundred percent of the time of everything that I think and feel. So you know, that's something that I struggle with. And it's going to hurt sometimes. It does. Because it, you're not, I don't know, I don't want to say living your truth, but you're holding yourself back. Yeah. No, I would say that it's definitely a version of not living my truth. Like, I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of things there. I'm also an empath, so I very easily take on any, you know, what, like, I. it's very easy for me to put myself in other people's shoes, and almost too easy, right? It, almost too easy. And sometimes that can that can be something where it's grateful. I think it's something that I think is a gift to the world. Like we all have something to get. I think empaths is, you know, what they can do is very beautiful and very healing and really helps to, I think, in different ways, bring people back to humanity. But it takes a lot out of you. Like it, there's just times where it's like, I, I just can't. I have to, again, there's that, it's that balance of, I, you know, finding my voice in these particular areas while also, okay, what are your boundaries? What are your limits? Like, 
How do you need to take care of yourself though so that I'm a better resource later on? I don't want to burn myself out right now. I've done that. You know, I've compounded stress is a real thing. Like, whew, you know, it just really, if we don't deal with it, like yeah. it's going to catch Builds up to up. us. So, you know, I don't want to find myself in five, 10 years, like completely burned out and unable to say anything because I didn't take the time to take care of myself now. And that's part of, you know, laying that foundation of, you know, good habits for wow. the future. That's really significant to say that it's, if you don't live it now, the feeling of not living it is going to build up and you're going to feel it later mm -hmm. in a negative way. Yeah, I think that whole concept of payment is can be applied to many parts of our lives. Like, you know, I, I, I think of it often when it comes to our health is that at some point we will have to pay for our health. We can either choose to pay for it now or we can pay for it later. But at some point, we will have to pay for it. It just depends on do you want to be in control of that or do you not? And I think that's kind of it's kind of that same concept is that, you know, I, I want to be able to lay those healthy foundations because I'm not just thinking about me now. I'm thinking about Ariel 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, which is just a wild thought to me. But like, that's what I'm thinking about. You know what's cool about that is that we're going to feel the same as we do right now. Yeah. Like we might look a little different because uh -huh. the body might. I think I'm going to be in better shape than I am now. I mean, I agree. I want to say totally that. To be totally honest. I want to say that. that too. Yeah. And I know that some people might roll their eyes and be like, oh my gosh. But to be totally honest, like, oh, there's, whoo, we could, this could be a whole other podcast right here because I have, I just. I think the human body is so tremendous and the, yeah. the, the, the capabilities that it has, like yeah. I, I think modern medicine, I think continues to forget and it doesn't matter which spectrum you're on continues to forget that we don't know anything. And actually the more and more that we continue to walk down this road of discovering the human body, all it is, is just, we just keep opening cans of worms. It doesn't mean that we're not learning anything. We certainly are, but to, to come to, to believe that we have quote unquote arrived at any of that or think that we've figured out, oh, that's not possible because, you know, we have this strong evidence over here. You know, if you were to ask a doctor a hundred years ago, do we have all the information we need to know about this? Right. They would have told you absolutely. Yes, we absolutely. do. We know we everything. I'm confident. I know it because, and, and at that time, that's what they would have thought. Yep. So it's just, I just think it's really important that as people, like I just am, I, I, I tend to believe that our, my human, my, our bodies are so much more capable than what we, so I, I, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say it out there that I'm going to look better. I'm going to feel better. I'm going to be um, much more vibrant you know, 20 years down the road. Same. Yeah. I will agree. Yeah. High five across the table. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Mm -hmm. And apart from physical though, mentally we will feel the same. It will be like nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so cool. I think that's so exciting. And I learned these, I realized the significance of that from Gary v, from Gary V t saying it once when he was where he was like if you're 21 right now you're 31 you're going to feel the same as you do when you're 41 51 and probably even 61 like you're going to feel the same and it's just going to continue and as long as you like are that way um and that's me adding to that that last bit but i just think that's so cool very it makes me really excited for the future yes Yes, absolutely. So dialing it back, is there anything else that you, like significant experiences that you um, had on your on your travels in this past year that you want to talk about? I think we've honestly covered quite a bit. Yeah. I, I think really that self-discovery piece is huge. And um, I think making the decision and deciding to to become a digital nomad despite the fear 
I think has just been one of the best decisions I've made in my life. It's very strange to me right now to think that it's already been a year. This year has flown by faster than any other year that I've ever had, you know, but I do feel more confident that I'm going into this next year as a digital nomad, you know, really feeling like I have a bunch of content that I'm ready to pump out. I feel confident with my modeling stuff. I feel confident with who I'm becoming as a woman and how I'm showing up in the world. So I'm just honestly excited for the future. That's great. I'm super yeah. excited for you. Thank you. It's, it's going to be bright and glorious. Yeah. We'll do have another one in a year. It'll be like a, an annual podcast. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thank you very much for having me on. It's been honestly pretty great to share. I think the follow up, which I think is just important to share as well. So continue with your good work and your own journey, which is super exciting. So appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much, Ariel, for coming on to the entrepreneur. Once again, it's been fantastic having you as well and hearing about your experiences and all that you've learned in just such a short amount of time, which is only a year. And it's so cool because a year, it goes by so fast, but so much happens in the year. And like, I know for me that I've grown so much in the past year from just the beginning of 2021 um, has been crazy, crazy, crazy big for me. And even the past month has been big. Just like it just like how you mentioned that the negative side of things compound. Well, it works in the opposite direction too. And I love that because the positive things in life compound and the, the it's, it's just a cascade of, yes, that feels good. Yes, that feels good. Yes, move forward. Yes, move forward. Yes, move forward. Yes, next. Yes, next. It's just a matter of where you decide, where I decide to live. Like, am I going to allow the negative to have power in my life? No, only as far as it will teach me. And then that's it. Pass that and nothing. I'm not going to leave it. I won't let it anywhere near me. And I'm going to maintain my boundaries that keeps me at my peace so that I can continue to receive what I'm attracting. And I love, love, love that. Love that. And I'm super grateful to be able to put this podcast together and that I have this equipment and the ability to create anything. And uh, I hope that you got some value out of this. If you're listening at this point, I appreciate you more than you know. And uh, don't forget to hit the like button, smash the like button and uh, hit subscribe too. maybe have a wonderful afternoon or evening or whatever time it is where you're at. And uh, we'll catch you next time on the Entrepreneur Hour. favorite episode so far because I talked like